Good morning. You are viewing one of a series of videos called Conversations with Mocha. Mocha is sitting next to me. We, Mocha and I, are speaking with various people in our community who are involved in the protection and care of animals. I'm Pat Belusic, the host for this series. I'm the president of the New York State Humane Association. And remember to view the description below for links to the New York State Humane Association website and also for additional information and links discussed during this session. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce our guest. Gretchen Primack is a writer, humane educator with the Ethical Choices Program and an animal activist. She's the author of two poetry collections, one of which is Kind, that explores the dynamic between humans and non-humans in our time and place, and Doris's Red Spaces. Gretchen also co-authored the memoir, The Lucky Ones, My Passionate Fight for Farm Animals, with a fam I'm sorry, Woodstock Farm Sanctuary co-founder Jenny Brown. Her pro poetry publication credits include the Paris Review, Plowshares, the Massachusetts Review, and many others. So, this is Gretchen Primack to my right. Gretchen, you are an educator with the Ethical Choices Program. Can you tell me what that program is about? Absolutely. Yeah, and thank you so much for having me. Hello. Um, yeah, Ethical Choices Program, or ECP, mm -hmm. is a fairly new humane education program based in Atlanta that has educators like me all around the country. And we go into high schools, colleges, our communities, to talk about and discuss the issues of modern agriculture, animal agriculture. Mm -hmm. So it might be animal agriculture and the environment, because those two things are unfortunately extremely tied. Mm -hmm. um, it may be animal agriculture and how it affects our health, because again, unfortunately those things are extremely tied. It might be the ethics that surround mm -hmm contemporary animal agriculture um, and issues. So they, they really range from um, how it affects our water to how it affects food scarcity in the world. And how do you bring that program to the schools? Do they somehow know to call you? Do you reach out to area schools or regional schools or how do you do that? I do indeed reach out to those schools, although word of mouth has brought some teachers to me because people more and more really want this kind of information out there. Maybe they are a biology teacher who's trying to talk about our planet and the world. Maybe it's a health teacher or a food and consumer sciences teacher. It might be a social studies teacher who's looking at the economics and government around these issues. And we're in a time and place where not paying attention to these issues is really dire. And I think that our uh, nation's educators understand that and they're starting to really want humane education in their classrooms. So they, they, be, they become aware of your website? I mean, I'm just curious as to how, say, a teacher in Kingston, New York, mm -hmm. or in this area might know to contact you. Yeah, so most of the time I reach out to them. Okay. Um, but through word of mouth, you know, mm -hmm. one teacher might say to another, listen, I had this speaker okay. in my classroom, it really engaged mm -hmm. the students, mm -hmm. the students really seemed to get it, I think mm -hmm. it would work in your classroom, and so then they might contact me. So you go directly and deal with the students, you don't go to a teacher's conference at the school. You, uh, you don't deal with the teachers and like right. teach the teacher. You go Correct. and present to students. Yeah, because teachers have very full plates. They right. have agendas and full plates. They like the fact that we bring curriculum that actually meet a lot of state standards, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. they don't have to be experts on everything. Right. right. They can bring in somebody who's an expert on this one very focused, very important subject and leave it to us. Okay. And of course the teacher's in the room so that he or she can also hear and start okay. to learn about um, okay. these issues as well. Um, and they also can uh, make sure that the students are getting what they need from okay. me. Okay, sounds good. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got involved with the animal issues? What prompted your dedication to working with animals and trying to improve their lot? Well, it's been a long process. Like a lot of people, I was a kid who loved animals and who was very passionate about my dog. Mm -hmm. And like most people, I did not connect that 
love for one animal, Natasha in this case, to a love for farmed animals, right? So I was, like most people, a person who was petting a dog and eating a cow at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I actually had a kid in my class, when I was talking about how much I love animals, say to me one day, well, are you a vegetarian? And I didn't really even know what a vegetarian was. I certainly was not a vegetarian. And I said, no. And he said, well, then. And I don't think that kid has any idea, Danny, <laughs> had a crush on him. I don't think he had any idea the effect that he had on my life. Because just having somebody to say, wait a minute, take a step back from the choices that you're making, right? He didn't know this. He was 13, you know. But take a step back and start to think about the choices that you make and why you make them. And I really couldn't defend that choice. I couldn't say, well, there's a really good reason why I pet one animal and eat another one. Mm -hmm. I, could, I didn't have a good reason. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it, and I kept eating animals, and I thought about it, and then one day I put my fork down. And I said, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, I don't want to live with that kind of thing. I can't say that I love Natasha and eat Natasha's brothers and sisters, essentially. And this was at a very young age that that kid said that to you. I was 13 when yeah. I became a vegetarian. But the reason that I say it's a process, because that just kind of took a couple of months, right. it really made sense to me, it was so obvious to me. Um, but what took longer was understanding the role that the dairy industry and the egg industry have to play, because I think I was someone who, again, like most people, just thought that cows sort of wanted to be milked and that that was a lovely thing and that chickens just sat in their backyard laying eggs and didn't want to have anything to do with them anyway. And, you know, it, it, it took a long time for me to understand the cruelty um, and the environmental devastation and the health devastation and the food security implications of the dairy industry and the egg industry that happened much later. That happened when I moved to the Hudson Valley. Um, so I was 13 when I was vegetarian, but I was in my 30s before I went vegan. And also around that time, really understanding the enormity and the complexity and the impact of these environments, that's what turned me into an activist, a real activist. So well before then, I was somebody who loved animals, who didn't eat animals, who uh, you know, tried to be a really kind person in the world, but right around when I understood really just how dire the situation is, I said, you know what, I don't even just want to do that. I want to be really active about this. Well, at this time, were you a teacher that was actually teaching in schools in, in, in a normal subject and then <laughs> moved to this, or weren't you a teacher at that point? Yeah, I was a writer and I was also an educator, okay. but not in the animal world. So I was an educator, I taught writing. And I did that um, in, for colleges. I did that um, at Ulster County Community College. I did it at Bard College. And then I actually did it with Bard Prison Initiative. And I taught in prison, um, mostly maximum security men's prison. And that was amazing work. Uh, and I loved it very much. But it's also been very satisfying to connect this passion of mine for animal issues and how important they are with the classroom. Oh. And when you were working with the prisoners with the BARD program, did you discuss the animal issues at all, or did that come into play? Yeah, it didn't come into play formally in the classroom, but who I was was an inescapable part of having, um, you know, very respectful uh, mutual relationships with adult students. Um, and so it was clear to them that I was um, uh, vegan that I uh, was making a choice to not participate in uh, animal cruelty industries. And they had a lot of questions about it. Some of them um, became vegetarian in prison. Can which they do that? Can it they is have choices? incredibly hard. Yeah. It's incredibly hard. The, res the incredible respect that I have, the admiration that I have for people who go vegetarian and vegan in prison is unparalleled it's because real hard. out here, yeah. I gotta say, it's really not that hard. No, not in really, there, not right, hard. right. In there, it's very hard. And I have, um, I had a student who became vegan as part of his desire to not cause violence anymore. Right, he was somebody who was in prison for having committed violence, and for him, becoming someone who was not violent included violence against other species. And he has since been released, and he is still an animal activist and vegan, and really putting that out into his community, that this is a way for us to be nonviolent people. This is one of the things that we do 
in our workshops, one of our speakers, Dr. Harry Hovel, who was a subject of one of our interviews, yes. uh, does an entire presentation on the connection between animal abuse and human violence. And if that's broken at some point, you can help that person to be a more humane individual. You have to attack it someplace. He recommends that if a youngster gets caught up in a, an animal crime, that it's got to be treated seriously, and the judges should recognize the importance and try to give that kid counseling, order counseling for him, and sense. so he doesn't go down that path. But it sounds like you were instrumental and successful in getting these folks that were adults and in prison ready to recognize that connection. You know, yeah, and in good. the case of the man that I just told you about, he had made that connection already mm -hmm. when I met him, and it was a bond that we had with each other that we both cared about these issues. Um, but with several others, I think, um, you know, I was part of why they started to think about these issues. Well, I think that's great. That's enormous change for these people. And as you say, they have no choice on what they eat in there, so it's got to be very difficult for them. Gretchen, uh, I'm very impressed with your book, your book of poetry, collect, one of your books of poetry called Kind. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you combined your activism with poetry, or were you a poet before? And then have you want, read one of your poems, if you would be so kind. I would love to. Um, kind is, um, like you said, a collection of animal poems. And it was an interesting thing. I had been a poet for quite a while, and well, had been an animal activist for quite a while, but I never combined those things. And I'm so glad that I did, both because it's been so much fun hearing from readers um, either readers who already are animal activists and felt affirmed and inspired by this, and also from people who it helped to raise their consciousness um, about animal issues. And this book has animals, you know, wild animals, domestic animals, farmed animals, um, etc. So uh, there's a lot of places for people to enter in. And um, I think in a way it's a lesson to people that whatever your passion is, you can apply it to animals. So I had a passion and a skill with poetry. And I thought, let me just see um, if it wouldn't be valuable to combine those loves and to have a book out in the world about animal issues. And I feel like it is. So I think um, it's a lesson that people can say, well, what is my skill and or what is my passion? Um, is there a way for me to connect that with my love of animals? Yeah, but yeah, I would love to read um, a poem. Where we are, we're very close to a Woodstock Farm Sanctuary, so a haven for rescued farm animals. And so this is a poem that was inspired by uh, a chicken who I met at a farm animal sanctuary. So I thought it would make sense to, to read this one. It's called Coxcomb. Abraham was a rooster. He'd been made to fight. He was not a fighter. He ended up in a basement. We brought him to the sanctuary. He loved peanut butter and jelly. He loved laps and Linda's pillow. He was not a fighter. He wanted to be held by toddlers, Phi Beta Kappas, grievers and socialists and pop stars. He wanted you to gentle his comb between your forefinger and thumb. It was a smooth, warm piece of a smooth, warm Abraham, and it blushed bliss. It was tender, like someone who had been as unloved as a chicken, and then as loved as a chicken could be loved. He grew old and full of love, and died, rubbing his head back and forth, back and forth against Linda's arm. We planted coxcomb, a growing glow. Thank you. That was very nice. Um, I'd like to find out uh, what your thoughts are on this. Do you think that the U.S., the United States as a whole, is moving towards a more humane ethic, given that McDonald's and others' uh, organizations or uh, chain, chain businesses are moving towards not factory farm, to get away from factory farm eggs in their products and so on? Do you see that as a a viable movement that will continue in the United States, that consciousness raising, if you will? I think there's a lot of consciousness raising. I think people are starting to see that the system that we have is not sustainable, 
it's not ethical, it's not healthy, and it's not environmentally sound. In terms of the way that we are dealing with it, I think we have a long way to go. Because the fact is that a company like McDonald's can start to try to make changes. Um, but when you have the kind of demand that McDonald's has for animal products, and when you have the price point that McDonald's has for its products, you simply can't have an ethical choice because they will still be factory farms. They will just be slightly different factory farms. In other words, if you look at the number of eggs that are needed for egg, mm -hmm. egg McMuffins, you can't do that with people having a couple of happy hens in their backyard. It's not possible. So uh, these companies are restricted in how ethical they can get by the sheer demand and the sheer price point of what they need to offer to people. So I really admire their willingness to try to take some steps, but I think the consumer also needs to take some steps and say, what companies am I willing to support in the name of um, keeping the habits and the customs of my society and myself and, and my culture? So it almost sounds as though it's a going to be a real education program to get people to recognize that both for health reasons and ethical reasons, they probably shouldn't go to McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's going to be very difficult. Yeah, yeah it is. We have though, um, I like to say that um, human beings are both very conservative and very adaptive so that we have a lot of trouble making change, but then when we do, we're really glad we did. If you look at something like um, the, the, the way that smoking has gone in the United States, something that for hundreds of years was really unquestioned, and people clamor and said, what do you mean we aren't gonna be able to smoke in bars? What do you mean I can't smoke on airplanes and in my workplace and in restaurants? What are you talking about? And there was such clamor around it. And then when the rules were put in place, it was great. And everybody felt like it was great, you know? So I think at the same time that we're, we fight choices that can be healthier for us and our planet, when we do it, we feel really good. And so it can end up being a really positive, um, well, positive that's effect. That's probably the most hopeful thing, is I also never thought that smoking would stop being <laughs> Never in never, a million years. Right? So but that's probably a good thing to hold on to as far as if that can happen mm -hmm. something more uh, with regard to the food thing. Yeah, and these food choices are even more um, of course in place and more societally entrenched than smoking. So I understand that this is a difficult thing, but you know what? We're seeing just magnificent changes. We're seeing millennials say, I really don't want to participate in this. You know, um, so I, I'm hopeful. Oh, okay. Uh, we're coming down to the end of our visit here. Uh, just briefly, can you comment on what you think the significant part of global warming that's attached to the entire factory farming phenomena? I mean, I know there in that Cowspiracy movie it brought out there was a large percentage, and yet the environmental people don't seem to want to go there. And I'm wondering if that, do you see yourself getting involved with that aspect of things in terms of your educational program to make people aware it's not just the food choice, not what it does to your body and the animals, but what it's doing with the environment. Are you, Absolutely. Are, are you going there with that? Absolutely. One of the main presentations that I give through Ethical Choices Program is an environmental presentation. And that environmental presentation makes it very, very clear that animal industry accounts for more climate change than every single form of transportation combined. And I love to say to a room full of students, how many of you know that cars and trucks contribute to climate change? And almost every hand goes up. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, how many of you know that animal agriculture contributes to cl climate change more than every single form of transportation in the world combined? Nobody's hand goes up, or one person's hand goes up. This is phenomenal. This is amazing. So we have all of this attention on industries that absolutely are causing climate change and that need to be reformed, and I drove here today in my hybrid, you know. 
but we have no attention on something that is even more important. And um, it boggles the mind. But it's interesting when Al Gore came with came out with an inconvenient truth, um, the documentary. He didn't talk about animal issues. He knew about them, but he didn't talk about them. And when he was questioned about that, he said it was too inconvenient a truth. Well, this is phenomenal, right? Because the whole point of that film was to show us the inconvenient truth, right? But he didn't show us one that he thought was just a little too inconvenient. We are ready to hear that now. We're ready to see that now. And Al Gore himself has completely changed his diet, and he is starting to talk about this. So we're ready now, and we need to pay attention, and we need to make changes. Okay. And by way of closing, if you could dictate how people behave, what would be the key three or four things that you would dictate that people should do to live a more humane life with regard to the animals? Well, I really feel that it starts with our refrigerators and the way that we order at restaurants and what snacks we have in our bags. I do feel that, and I feel that because the vast, vast, vast majority of animals who live in the United States, the vast majority are farmed animals. The number of companion animals we have, and I say this as someone with two beloved rescue dogs and five beloved rescue cats, are minuscule. You know, if you look at the number of farmed animals and the number of domestic animals, it's, it's almost statistically non-relevant. Okay, that's how enormous they're. So I feel like a focus on attention to these really unseen and really suffering living beings who are every bit as sentient as our darling Mocha and my darling Neville and Ramona and my darling Clarence and Sylvia, you know, um, that, that that attention needs to be there. So I think, and it's also so powerful, it's so amazing that we actually have the power to create change and to live our values just by the choices we make when we reach for dairy milk or when we reach for almond milk, right? It's the same action. You take them to the same exact, you know, checkout line and with one of them, you're contributing to the suffering of the animals, and with one other one, you're not. You know, so that's the main thing that I would that I would counsel me. Even if it's just working on doing that a little less, right? Every bit helps. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Gretchen, for being with us today. I really appreciate it. And folks, remember to subscribe to our video series, Conversations with Mocha, by clicking the subscribe button below. Also, you can request to receive notifications for each new video by clicking the button next to the subscribe button. Thank you very much for watching, and thank you again, Gretchen. What a pleasure, Pat. Bye -bye. Thanks so much.